Hey, John here. Let's have a look at this nice little simple program, make sure that we know what's going on before we delve into how it does what it does. All right, what do we got? We got a main, it calls foo subroutine. Foo subroutine comes along, it prints out this hello message and puts a carriage return after it, and it returns back to main. When main is done, uh, when, that, when that happens, main calls it a second time does the same thing and returns comes back to main it comes back to a different place right uh, because then main is going to call it the third time it'll print hello again and when it returns it'll return back down here where main itself will return a zero back to the operating system and terminate the program let's make sure it works never underestimate my own ability to screw up even the most mundane Program, yes, it does work. Prints it out three times. All right, now let's look and see how the address space is used to execute this program. Now let's assume this box represents the address space of our running process. And we know that in the bottom is the text region, so there will be the main function here, the executable instructions that represent that code will go down there, as will the foo function all right this collectively will end up in the text region okay after that is your data the bss we're not directly using that so that's not particularly interesting right now to us uh what comes after that the heap and it grows up we're not using that either in this particular example what is interesting is up here the stack, the program call stack. Let's look and see what happens in there while this thing runs. It's going to fill up with what we call a stack frame. Or stack frames, plural. All right? One stack frame with an E would be nice. <laughs> is created every time a subroutine, a function is, is uh, executed. All right? or called, we should say. These are known by other names like activation records or even activation frames. You know, all these words mean the same thing. So let's look and see what's happening in there. When main executes, we already know that it can have data variables located in the BSS and the data region if you so define them there. If it had local variables, however, where do they go? They don't go in the heap, they go up here in the stack frame. When main calls a subroutine, that subroutine needs a place to hold its local variables and things, assuming it does not use the BSS or data for its storage either. That's also gonna go up here in the stack. What does foo do when it's done running? How does it know where to go to when it's done? How does it know it got called in from main? For that matter, in our example that we just looked at, foo gets called three times. So how does the first one know to go back to main so that the second one can execute? How does the second one know to go to main so that it can come back and the third call executes? And the third one, of course, goes back to main, and when that happens, main doesn't call it again at all. Main terminates. So foo has to know what to do when it's done, all right? This information all goes in the stack frame. So let's look and see how this works. When, May, when main first wakes up, it will find a stack frame up here. This is the one case where a stack frame is created for main by the operating itself when it constructs this address space. So this is sort of a, 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 um, a special case. Let's call that one stack frame number zero. And I'm going to say, uh, I'll put main under it so we remember. Okay. This one is created by the operating system. What's in here? It has a return address. And I'll abbreviate it like that. I use the at symbol to represent an address. Now, other things can go in here as well, but for now, this will suffice. Okay. When main invokes foo that first time, what happens? Uh, what happens is the stack frame has to be created and pushed into the call stack. So what does it do? As we will see, it can have more things in it than this simple example, but at a minimum, it has to put the return address in here to tell Foo where to go when it's done. And specifically, it'll point into the text region down here at the instructions 
that are to be executed after the call to Foo completes, all right? Uh, if Foo itself can add additional data into this stack frame if it wants to, like if it had local variables and so on, it would put them in here as well. We'll see that in a minute. So these stack frames are the trivial examples here. Stack frame one. Right now, main calls foo the first time. So this frame is created in order to invoke that foo. So let's call that one uh, foo one. All right. Foo executes. It then has to print something. In order to print something, it has to invoke the um, the operator on C out, right? Because it's going to call C out, double left arrow, and then write hello, right? Like that. Well, this is just shorthand for a subroutine call. So it's going to have to create another stack frame. Not only will it have to tell it how to get back when it's done, it also has to tell it about this message hello right so it's actually going to put the hello in here or a pointer to a string in some way shape or form it has to put the parameter that this operator needs this subroutine call that will ultimately get invoked in the standard out printing routine okay it has to give it a reference or a value uh, for it to print it'll also have to give it the return address where this is supposed to go when it's done so it then executes it you know uses the operating system or whatever this is kind of a black box to us it then completes and it says okay i'm done now i need to go here right well this is actually pointing again down inside this code down here inside this executable instructions for foo right so when he's done he comes back to foo this stack frame is popped off the stack it's 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 gone all right foo is now running and as you recall it has nothing to do at this point and it too returns it goes back to this address inside main and as a part of that returning this stack frame goes away it's popped off okay now we're kind of out of paper and if this was a whiteboard i could erase this but I don't have that luxury with a pen and paper. When main calls foo the second time, all right, it will create a new stack frame at this point, right? Because the stack, stack actually has a, a variable. There's a variable called a stack pointer that points to the bottom, or shall we say the top, right? In this case, since it grows down, it's the lowest address. I know that's a little bit of confusing, but bear with me here. The top of the stack is right here before foo gets called stack frame is put in there pushed into the stack and the pointer moves down here that calls this guy over here the pointer comes down here and so on if there were more subroutine calls it would just keep on going down when the subroutines return the pointer goes back up that's how you pop these things off okay now when may calls foo the second time it puts another stack frame in here to call it let's call that one foo dot two it will physically go in the same place where this one used to be the space is reclaimed all right stacks are fairly efficient uh data structure there's only one single variable to remember where it is and where the top of it is it's this stack pointer thing okay that's it in fact they're usually managed in hardware on on a lot of popular cpus so the food uh, the new foo stack frame will overwrite whatever happens to be in the stack. That foo will run. He'll create a stack frame to print hello and the carriage return, and it'll go down here. That'll finish. Pop it off. This will come back to foo. It will finish. Pop its thingy off. Go back to main. Call it the third time. The same thing will happen again. And then main ultimately returns back to the operating system that cleans up this entire address space when the process finishes. All right, let's look at one that's a little bit more interesting. See this foo here? I've added a an argument here called i. And I have a local variable called j. It equals i times 2, and I say i equals i, j equals j, and carriage return. Now in my main, I pass it a, an argument each time, foo1, foo2, foo3, and ultimately we return like this, okay? So let's go ahead and compile that one. 
and run it to make sure it works. Okay, and it does what we think. I and J, main passes a one, a two, and a three for the I each time, and J equals I times two, so we see that printing out like this. So that looks fine. Let's take a close look at the stack frames and how they're used in this scenario. Again, we have this notion of an address space for our running process. In the text, we have main, and we have a foo, that this time takes an I as an argument. We're not using the data. We're not using the BSS. We don't really care so much right now. And we're not really using the heap, but we know it's there, right? Stack frames, what do they look like? The first one, OS creates this one, stack frame zero is for main. At a minimum, it has a return address in it. All stack, frame, all stack frames have a return address in them. That's an absolute given. It will also contain the arguments that are passed to foo. How else does foo get them, right? Well, uh, some optimizations can be made, but because foo gets a different value every time it's called, even in this simple example here, it's called with a one and a two and a three, those arguments need to be passed in somehow. It turns out they're put in the stack frame, just like the hello was in the previous example. So main would put i equals four in the stack frame. It'll give it a return address. Okay. When foo starts running, it will expand it. And it will put j in here. Okay. It's a local variable. All local variables. Okay. Okay. This is an argument. All this stuff goes in the stack frame or in the activation record, if you prefer that, no, in the, that, that name. Okay, so when foo then runs, it can manipulate the value of j. If it needs to store it somewhere, I mean, obviously this is where it's going to be. When it's done, it knows where to go. It has its arguments passed in up here. Perfectly understandable. That's stack frame fun. And, and then, you know, when it's running, remember, it has to print something, so it's going to create a stack frame number two with a return address and uh, whatever. This time it's going to have, you know, i equals whatever. And, and I actually call... Um, the um, the C out operator four times. It'll say I equals. Then it will say I. Then it will have another time when it says J equals, right? With it. So it'll call it once with a string. It'll call it once with an integer variable. Then it'll call it again with a string. And then it'll call it again with an integer value. And in fact, it'll even call it again with the end L. I can spell in order, it would help. So that I'll actually end up ultimately getting called one, two, three, four, five times. So this thing will push a stack frame in for the I equals. It'll print that. It'll pop that off and come back to the uh, foo subroutine, who will then call it again on behalf of uh, printing the I, right? It'll get, and then push in a stack frame to print the integer value. Then it'll get popped off back here. It'll get uh, it'll then create a stack frame that says J equals, and it'll call the uh, uh, insertion operator to be printed on standard out for this string, and then it'll put the J value itself in there as an integer and call it again, and so on. So this thing will get called five times. It'll be create and remove this five times. Ultimately, it'll come back to the foo subroutine. This will get popped off, and foo will return back to main at the address here, just like we did in the last example, only to be, in this case, called a second time and a third time. So this thing is constantly having things pushed into it and popped back out of it. All right? At any point in time, if we freeze the running of this program and we look at this call stack, we can tell what's running and we can know what's going on. This is exactly what is used by the GDB debugger when your program runs. So let's have a look, see at that, and see how we map it back to this diagram. All right, so let's build this and run it with the debugger. You just simply type GDB and then the name of the program that we just compiled. Now, if you run it, you can just type run. And normally this is what you do with a program that dies well, it's going so you can figure out where it dies, uh, but this doesn't really die. It just runs to completion. So the debugger, as you can see, just simply runs it and it says when it's done that this process 
has exited normally. So this is what happens with a normally running program. We can get out of the debugger or whatever, quit. <clears throat> and uh, let's start it back up again. Okay, so if you don't want to run the whole thing, you can just say start, which gets it ready to run the program, but it does not actually run anything. So it says breakpoint. It, it reached a breakpoint. It stopped while getting ready to execute your main subroutine on line 10 of this file. Now, if I want to, I can type in list. And what list will do is give me like plus or minus five lines around the currently executed uh, line of code there, all right? So you can see line 10, it printed out this thing, which is the open curly, but I'm like, I can't remember where that is in my program. So you type list and there's the open curly on line 10. And now you got a little more context. So if I say step, I'm going to execute, in this case, line 10. It says I'm ready to run line 10. So I will hit step, and it will do line 10. I don't think that an open curly does nothing, all right? It actually can do something. In this case, it really doesn't accomplish anything. However, if you were writing a C++ program that had constructors and things that had to be called, as a result of entering a block of code or exiting a block of code, then these actually do have a lot going on, and they'll manipulate those things. You'll see, like, the destructors get invoked and so on. All right, so actually that, uh, in this example, it didn't do anything. Again, we could type list. You can see it moved it to line 11. It says, I will execute this call to foo if you step into the next uh, instruction. So let's go ahead and do that. I should not have actually used the word instruction there. I should have said statement. Each time I type step, it executes an entire C statement. And we'll see in a minute that requires multiple instructions and in the machine level to make that happen. All right. So I just stepped into, in this case, the function foo. And when you do that, it says, OK, I now entered into foo and its argument is one. And I'm sitting here looking at line four of probe1.cc, which is the open curly at the beginning of the foo function. And of course, you know, when you have more than 15 lines of source code in your program, uh, you know, many different files and things like that, GDB will be tracing it along and you'll be able to go list up different files and stuff like that. So now we're here on line four. Now we're in the middle of foo. Or we're starting to run foo, I should say. And this is when a command like where is more interesting. Okay, you can do this in main too if you really want to. But it, it, it wouldn't illustrate my point if we weren't in the middle of a subroutine. If you type where, what you're asking it to do is display the stack frames for you. Now, this guy numbers them in the opposite way I did in my diagram, okay? Uh, the zeroth stack frame in this particular display is the top of the stack, right? That's the thing that is executing now. So that's the stack frame for foo. Number one would represent the stack frame from uh, of the caller that called foo. So we can see what's going on here really nicely, all right? Let's look and see what all these fields really mean. When I'm in foo on line four, which is right here, and I'm about to ready to start coding, I came from main on line 11, which I could type list again. Every time you type list, it'll list the next section of code. So if I just keep typing list, it goes forward and forward and forward, all right? Now, the what to list gets reset every time I do a step or I continue or execute a breakpoint or whatever, okay? So uh, you can just keep typing list and see more and more of your code is my point. And that's what I just did now. So I can get an eyeball on what is on line 11 of my code and clearly see that that's where main called foo and passed it a one. So this makes perfect sense, right? What's that thing? Well, that is the return address. If we type disassemble and we give it this, uh, or more accurately, let's give it main. I can say, hey, disassemble code of the main function, all right? This is what came out of the compiler. These are executable 
instructions on my, you know, Intel AMD processor or whatever it is I got on this PC, okay? Now, while this isn't, of course, an assembly language, but you can sort of make this out. Look and see what's going on here. We see this giant address, blah, 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 and it ends in 52EB. Look and see what's at 52EB. If you do know a little bit about assembly language, this is clearly the address to which you pick up after you return from the first time you called Foo. So let's look a little bit and kind of intuit what's going on here. What does the main function do? It, this sub means subtract 8 from, you got it, that's the stack pointer register in this particular kind of CPU. All right? So what did he do? He moved it down to make room for a stack frame. Inside this stack frame, he's putting this uh, one value that's going to be passed as a parameter to the foo routine. Now, this has actually got a little bit of optimization going on here. Those of you that know more about this, that's fine and dandy. Just leave it in the general sense. This is moving the one into the stack frame as an argument to foo. All right? Call Q here means... Go to this address and start executing. It's a branch of sorts. And then the GDB disassembler offers us a nice little clue that says, oh, by the way, this number here just so happens to be the address where this foo function is that takes this integer argument, all right? So this is what main does to get that first call to foo done. When foo is done running, it needs to go back and do the next thing which obviously at this point is to put a 2 into the uh, uh, activation record, into the stack frame, so that you can then call foo again. Now notice that the compiler was kind of smart. It's reusing that stack frame. It doesn't actually destroy it and recreate it. It just keeps reusing the one it already has. If you look down here, eventually, you see it says add 8 back here. This is where it actually moves the stack pointer back up to get rid of it. All right? This is just a simple optimization. That's all. So you can see the three calls. You can clearly see the arguments that I'm passing it each time. All right? And you can clearly see that this number here is the return address. Okay? So that was the whole point of this, <laughs> this little tangent here. Okay? All right. So now let's take a look. Let's remember where the heck we are. Uh, I'm going to obviously type where again. I'm here at line six, so let's just type list. Uh, you can, I think you can type the like just just like uh, the file name colon one or something like that, and you can then list from whatever you want. Okay, so this is where I'm at in my stack. I'm about to execute the code on line six. Notice it did, never said anything about this guy here. It turns out this ended up getting optimized away by the compiler. So don't get too disoriented by GDB here, right? Remember, what GDB is doing is it's doing its best job to show you what the source code was translated into and how it's going to get executed. If the compiler decides it doesn't need to do this operation, it may not even show up as something that the debugger is going to know about to even do in the first place. We call that optimizing something away. And it turns out that multiplying a number by two can be done quite easily by shifting it left one place. It'll be on this lecture here, but just be aware that the uh, debugger can optimize things away at times and cause you a little disorientation, but you know, it's easy to kind of see how that could happen. Anyway, uh, where are we at? We are about to execute um, uh, line six, which is this thing here. Now, if we do this, it's gonna step into this subroutine to try and print the I equals, right? And uh, we're gonna end up wandering around through millions of instructions to see how this whole thing works. We could probably do another where here and see some more interesting things going on if we really want to. Uh, usually when you're debugging, you're not really trying to debug the operating system libraries, but knock yourself out if that makes you happy. If you accidentally step into a function like this, what you can do is type finish, and it'll just say, look, just finish this whole thing until you return from the current subroutine, or in other words, until you finish this particular stack frame and you end up back up in this guy here. So I can do that, 
And it does say run till exit of stack frame zero, okay? And it does that. Everybody's happy. And uh, where am I now? I'm sitting here on line six of, uh, of my foo function. We can do another step. And what it's doing now is notice it just did the J equals and so on. So this is going to do it <laughs> for each of these five things, all right? So let's go ahead and finish that one. Somewhere in here, it'll print out the J equals. It'll actually do it. It's probably getting lost in our noise here. Oh, you know what's actually going to happen? This is another phenomenon that takes place. It won't actually show up on the screen until it flushes its buffer. Because remember, we're actually stepping through actual low-level code here. Okay, so what we're doing is 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 uh, looking at another optimization take place in this particular case. It's going to want to finish printing all these things until it prints this carriage return, and then you'll actually see it pop up on the screen. So what are we doing now? We step in again. And it says, "Oh, look!" So you can even see it says things have been optimized out and so on. So let's go ahead and finish this one, and you can actually see at this point it finally finished uh, the the repeated calls to the printing root routines and it, you can see that it says i equals one j equals two and it we are now back on line 12 of main okay so where we're back in here we can do a list all right so anyway the point of looking at the gdb stuff here is i wanted you to see the fact that how these stack frames manifest themselves and if you ever use a debugger you need to be you're, you're going to be staring these things right in your face now you can see the second call to foo when i is two now because i don't want to go through all this again we could just type finish just like we did when we were trying to deal with the print routine now you can just finish all of foo and you'll see all of foo run and the print routines and all of its subroutines all that will finish and then it'll say okay i'm done with that and now i'm over here again to call foo for the third time now it turns out there's a step command that you've been seeing there's also a um there's another command, and <laughs> suddenly it skips my mind. But this is why we have help, okay? So it turns out GDB has a help function. If you say help step, it probably says see also this other thingy. And of course, it does not. N means n times or da 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 da. da. Okay. Uh, what is it? Is it? There's like a notion of stepping into a function versus stepping over the function. I guess this is a. Uh, an argument to reading the manual at some point okay turns out the other command is next if i type next in here it won't step into this foo function it will execute everything until it gets to the next line in the current function which is main so this will say do everything until i come back on line uh 14 okay uh, and you can see it did and you can see the printout right there and again we can see we're in main at line 14 of our source code if i step uh, on that instruction main will then return and in order to return from main it's going to go in and uh execute a bunch of operating system stuff and it even says oh i can't find this source code to help you uh that you know again if you're outside of your code it may not be able to show you all the source code of the operating system and other things if you end up uh, um stepping into all that stuff so you can probably type finish at this point and uh and it will not return because this is actually going to finish the entire program and you then run to the end of the code so this is a little bit jumpy and sloppy but you know what this is a very realistic example of what, what you're going to see happen when you use gdb i'd like to have made this uh perfectly but realistically might be far more helpful for you as an example here so i'm going to stick with this as it is all right i guess the walk away the takeaway here is you know you don't necessarily want to be messing around with some of this stuff it gets kind of hairy i tend to use gdb only when i can't figure out the problem by intuiting what's wrong with my code and by that i mean you know you add a couple of print routines and things like that to see where it's at to try and figure out how the thing is giving me trouble. If you end up getting a core dump in your program, like let's make one of those on purpose. How do you do that, right? Well, we can probably do something like this. If you declare a pointer and you set its value to zero, 
Uh, this may not even compile. I may have to cast that zero. But then you say star p equals, you know, 32. It depends how smart the compiler is. It may know that that's... Oh, look at that. The compiler didn't help me. That's great. Okay, so this is one nice way to create a core dump. Okay, this will obviously not... Um, work correctly because I'm not allowed to write at address zero because that's reserved. If you run this and you see you have a segment fault core dump, here's my point. The point I'm trying to make here is this is when I use GDB. I go, oh, I don't know what happened to my program. I got a core dump. I have no idea where. I have no idea why. I don't know. It's just broken. If you run it in here with the run command, it'll go until it dies. And when it dies, it says, it died on line 9 of prog1.cc while it was trying to do this. I can type where if I want to. And we can see that as an optimization, it didn't even <laughs> store the I number in there. That's okay. Um, main called foo with some value to be printed. And you died while doing this. All right. What do I do now? I could say print P. And it says, you got a variable called p whose value is currently 0. Now, I know that it was 0 because I set it to 0. However, <laughs> there can't be a variable there. If this, isn't the, I mean, this, is the, this is the answer to your problem, right? So when you're running your programs, if they core dump and you don't immediately know why, uh, just run it with GDB like I did here. Run says start it up, run it forever until it either finishes or until it dies. And when it dies, tell me where it died. Sometimes all you need to know is it died on, on that line. Okay. Other times, you're not so sure. You need to poke around a little bit. You can look at the sprint command. Okay. Now, you can always type help and start at the beginning. And it says, you know, help has all kinds of different types of help. You want help about the stack. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Help about how you run your program, and inside here we will probably find the step and the, there's a continue and how to do a breakpoint, all sorts of things you never even heard of before. Um, how to start the program, how to step over a program, how step I. This apparently will step a single in, uh, assembly language instruction instead of a single you know source line or a statement in C, for example, right? Uh, there's a whole lot of options in here, and you can just read about them to your heart's content. You can also Google, uh, do a Google search on GDB and, and find all kinds of doc. Okay, so what's the, t what's the whole takeaway in here? We know what a stack frame is. We know wh why we have them. We know what goes in those stack frames in order to provide a mechanism whereby a function can execute with local variables and other functions can call them. I can call foo and I can send it to i. It has a place to store its local variables and so on. So thanks for watching. See you next time.